That was the phenomenal Ethan Brosh with Space Invaders. That actually is off his newest and recent release called Live the Dream. We're going to check out the phones right now because Ethan is on the other line. You there, ma'am? I'm there. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, no problem. Hi, can you hear me better now? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. If I get a little too loud, just let me know. I'll back off a little bit. Actually, Space Invaders was really loud in my ear. but <laughs> Was it? Oh, man, I'm sorry. You should have said something when I chimed in on you. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> I like my music loud, so. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. Can't complain. Welcome to the G-Spot. How are you and what's going on? Um, I'm doing great. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm getting ready because uh, I'm going on tour with Jakey Lee at the beginning of December. So I'm just um, getting ready for you know getting all the details ready for that and i'm just really excited you know it's uh basically going on tour with one of my my guitar idols that i grew up listening to so um i did it last year with Inva malmstein and now i'm gonna do it uh all over again with jakey lee so for me it's, it's a very exciting time your resume is long vast and quite impressive can you elaborate just a little bit on your background uh my background um i guess uh to just um uh, the short version of uh, my background is that I basically found a cassette of um, Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast in uh, my br my older brother's cassette collection back in the day, and I just saw the Eddie on the cover, and I was just completely mesmerized. And I just had to listen to it. And I just gotten so into Iron Maiden, which is still my favorite band. And ever since that day, I just, I became obsessed and I wanted an electric guitar. And, you know, Iron Maiden really made me pick up the guitar in the first place. And that just um, started a, a long process of try of basically discovering all the great bands and, and players back in the day and yeah that started the journey so that's basically it you released your second instrumental cd earlier this year called live the dream what can you tell us about this cd and how does it compare if at all with your debut cd um well i would say that the difference is that when I created my first CD, Out of Oblivion, I really had no idea of how to make a record. And even when I already started recording it, I still had no idea of what the process was really like. I, I didn't even really understand what, what mixing was all about. Um, even at the stage when I was already tracking uh, like drums and, and guitars, and I, I really had no idea what I was doing. And that's part of the reason why it took so long, because I had to redo a lot of things and and I didn't want to finish it until it was uh, until it sounded really good, and it was a pretty painful process to go through. And the other thing w about Out of Oblivion was that um, this was a collection of tunes that I wrote over a really long period of time, and some of the tunes uh, are, you know, basically they basically go as far back as as possible when I just first started uh, writing music. So some of those tunes have a lot of passion in them, but lack a little bit of maturity and with live the dream it's just uh it's a different story because i, I just um kind of learned a lot from my mistakes from out of oblivion so i think overall it's a better made record uh which one is actually better musically that's uh that's not for me to decide <laughs> and uh, i i really can't i really can't decide um but you know it's just a, the two different stages of my life but at the same time i you know there's definitely a decision there of of, um, staying within the same vein because um, I've, I, I always hated when my favorite bands just changed and took a different direction it was it just never ended up good so <laughs> this CD is truly amazing oh thank you your guitar work is phenomenal and Space Invaders has some insane guitar work in it can you tell us how this track came to life um yeah sure um Space Invaders, um, I really like it. It came out really crazy. 
although it's a very, very straightforward kind of tune. There's nothing too fancy about it. Um, it just, it started by me writing a riff that I wanted that kind of a 16th note feel that, you know, it's kind of like reminiscent of uh, Racer X a little bit. But at the same time, I wanted to have a really nice and sweet melody on top of it. And for the longest time, I had the first half of the melody on top of that riff. And I thought the first half of the melody was really good. And I tried to complete the melody and I had so many different versions of the second part of the melody. And it just, it never clicked. It just, uh, I wasn't satisfied with it. And it took probably over a year for me to just uh, complete the melody and be like, ah, now it sounds like it really matches the first part and it really works you know, well with the first part. And to me, the, the, that's really how I approach writing instrumentals to begin with. I, I try to have a song form and I try to keep it um, really interesting because the, the one thing that's really easy to do with instrumental music is just to bore the listener out of their mind because um, you know it's it's just it's a lot of notes and, and there's no vocals so uh, one of the challenges is to really keep it very fresh and interesting so what I try to do is just um, looking at the at the album as a whole I just try to have every tune be very different be a different key be a different groove be a different speed be a different a different type of mood different sounds everything has to be different just to be kept fresh and um, for each tune uh, specifically it has has to have some kind of a song form that it has an intro and a verse and a chorus and then yeah of course a solo section and and all these uh, all these fun things but at the same time it has to it has to say something and the melody is just something very very important and I I didn't complete Space Invaders until the melody was actually really strong so yeah that's that's pretty much uh, the story behind that one impressive over a year just to get this thing down wow. It's a long time, man, but you know what? You sound like an individual, and from what I've seen, you seem like the person that is very methodical in what they do, and you want things just perfect. I think all artists are like that in some sense, because you would want it a certain way, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, I mean, that's exactly how it is, and it's a painful quality to have, and it's really <laughs> not good for business, <laughs> but... <laughs> It is what it is, you know, it's it's art at the end of the day. Dude, the way you play, you don't have to worry about whether it's bad for business or not. <laughs> Another track that is illuminating is Up the Stairway. It obviously has some Zeppelin-type sound to it and resembles the song pretty closely. What did you have in mind, or what was on your mind, when you first decided to do this song, and how did you approach it putting your spin on this classic? Now, before you answer that, I noticed with this song, it sounded almost like you took Jimmy Page's riffs and kind of went backwards with them. Yeah, it's it's an arguable point nowadays if it really is Jimmy Page's uh, riff, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, so I figured, you know, I probably have 40 years until they come after me. But then again, uh, the way it came about was, um, believe it or not, you know, I was just, um, you know, th it came from teaching guitar. And, you know, everyone has to know Stairway to Heaven. So, you know, I teach Stairway to Heaven to a lot of kids. And um, it, it just got, I got tired of teaching Stairway to Heaven, as you can imagine. Imagine. But at the same time, you know, the, that chord progression it has uh, such a beautiful descending bass line. It's, uh, it goes down chromatically and it creates really nice changes as a result. And I was just, you know, looking at it, like I, I got stood up by a couple of students, you know, and I was just waiting for the next student and I had some time to actually practice, which is something that doesn't really happen very often anymore. Um, but what, what I did was I just, um, I, the, the last student that just left, I, you know, I taught him Stairway to Heaven and I had the chords fresh in my mind and um, just in between students, I just, you know, I was going over it and I was just thinking, well, what can I play over this chord and what can I play over that chord? And all of a sudden, it, it just, um, it, something really interesting happened. And I'm like, this could be an interesting arrangement of, um, of Stairway. So that's, uh, that's the story behind this one. It is very interesting and I absolutely loved it, regardless if it was Stairway to Heaven or not. It almost seemed like you were playing it back. 
backwards, you still could detect that Led Zeppelin style and sound. You've worked with some incredible talent since you came onto the scene. Who was the most memorable for you in terms of their style of playing? I know you mentioned how you fulfilled the dream with Ingve. You've been doing some work with some major people, and I'm curious to know who was the most memorable for you. Um... Well, it, it, it's hard to really point the one person who's the most memorable because for me, um, the fact that I get to do some kind of work in some fashion with the people that I really grew up on idolizing, people like, um, you know, George Lynch and Greg Howe and Inve Malmsteen and J.K. Lee, for me, you know, the, those people are, I, I discovered them in a really young age and the fact that I get to do some, some kind of work with them is just amazing for me. So it's hard for me to really choose one because I, I really, you know, I love all these players very much. Um, of course, Inve is very memorable because Inve is Inve, you know, and <laughs> and that tour was just, you know, just putting it together and going through it, and it was not an easy tour as far as um, traveling goes. Um, it was just, everything was so over the top on this tour. This was a really, a, a once-in-a-lifetime experience, you know, and probably even took years off of my life, but, um, but it was just, it was so much fun. It was it was a real blast, and uh, anything with Inve is uh, pretty much unforgettable. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that such a long time ago when I just started out and and George Lynch and Greg Howe played on my record, for me, this is like, I listen back to it now and and I still get goosebumps. It's amazing. And the fact that Derek Riggs, the artist of uh, Iron Maiden, did my, did my album cover for my first album, this is something that, you know, I never imagined would ever happen. Just amazing work you do and the talent that you've surrounded yourself with you mentioned george lynch you played a track with him called downward spiral in 2012 it was recorded years before that uh but we, yeah we shot a video in 2012 and i watched it and i just went wow what was it like playing with him with this track and, and doing this video like was he very easy to follow and because a lot of it's timing um that whole deal is actually a really long story but um technically you know george George was actually on tour with Lynch Mob, and I opened for him in uh, Creston, Rhode Island, with my other band, Burning Heat. And luckily, they actually had two days off right after that show, and we managed to um, to shoot that video two days after the show that I opened for him. And um, it was something that I had to put together really quick. I had one day to figure out all the details of the location because it was raining outside, and like and. Uh, uh, get the cameraman and get everyone on the same page and we had a very short amount of time to actually shoot the whole thing and this was again this was years after this track was recorded so you can imagine that George you know probably, he probably forgot what he played the day that he recorded it so mm -hmm. you know let alone like six years later or whatever it was um, so basically I had like the night before I had to learn George Lynch's parts and do during the video, we had to shoot the video in segments, and I had to show him his parts. And then, um, you know, we were working on it. it was it, It's so beautiful to watch George work, you know, and I would show him, like, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's what you're playing. And he's like, well, I probably played it this way, you know. I, I wouldn't do that fingering. I would probably do something like this. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what George would do. You know, it's really awesome to see that. And, you know, I knew that this video, I knew that day that we did something really special, and that, you know, I, I couldn't be more grateful, uh, you know, to George for really helping me out. And, uh, I, you know, I knew that this is going to be something that 25 years from now I'm going to look back on and be like, wow, this is this is so cool. I know you've had a lot of formal training. You've taught quite a bit. But your style and sound renders me speechless, and your speed seems to break barriers. Other than your formal training, did you do anything other than that to develop your technique, and were you looking looking for a specific style to delve in. I know you mentioned how you fell in love with Iron Maiden when you first heard it, and that's what got you into grabbing a guitar. Would you say they are the ones gave you your style? Um... Well, I mean, Iron Maiden had a huge influence and impact on me, no doubt. And 
especially about songwriting and even guitar playing. I think Adrian Smith is just a, a excellent guitar player. But you know, my style my style changed and got shaped many times over through the years with a lot of the players that I've discovered. And a lot of it is just me messing around with the guitar and just looking for for certain things. You know, like when you learn a certain scale, you'll visualize it in a certain way, and and someone else will visualize it in a different way. So everyone has the potential of really developing their own style and their own unique way of playing. The only problem is that a lot of people, when they fall in love with one guitar player, say like a Zach Wilde or a John Petrucci, and they just, you know, for them, that that's what they need to be. And they just try to buy all the equipment that, they, that they're that they using and buy all the clothes that they're wearing. And it's pretty obvious what they're trying to go for. And for me, I guess I rip off everybody. So <laughs> it's kind of unclear what I'm doing what I'm doing or, or who I'm ripping off but at the same time you know besides just ripping off people I try to actually explore different scales and different ideas and and come up with my own techniques and variations of techniques and try to come up with my own melodies and, and my own style in the end you know if you just do it for long enough and you're and you, if you don't make the mistake of just following one person 100% then um, I guess you can develop your own style everyone has the the ability of looking at the guitar in a way everyone's going to visualize it in a different way so I, I think anyone can develop their own style and the question is will they do it first of all I don't think you've ripped anybody off and secondly I'm very thorough when it comes to the music I like if you don't mind I'm going to put you in a category that not many will go into as a matter of fact in today's world I mean yeah you have Jimi Hendrix even John Butcher Access great guitar Power players, phenomenal. Yeah. But the two I've seen most recently in the past five to ten years that have made a huge impact on me is number one, John Five. The guy is blistering with speed. And now you. Some of the stuff I seen, I thought he was fast. You are, and I'm not saying being fast is the good thing or the cool thing being a guitarist, but the speeds at which you guys play are just mind boggling. I mean, I can't, I watched some like tutorials that John Five did and it was a blur. You couldn't even see his hand. I caught that in one of yours. So I am putting you in that same category. You're an absolutely insane guitar player. I don't care what you do. I don't think you've ripped anybody off. You've just put your spin on it. It's amazing stuff, man. Uh, uh, thank you so very much, Greg. I really appreciate that. According to your website, you have an upcoming Northeast tour. What can you tell us about it and how excited? are you in the band for this tour? Um, well, I can tell you that we're all actually very excited. You know, um, I have re a really great band. I have uh, Giorgio Mongelli on bass. I have Nate Montalvo on, on second guitar. And then I have Dan Whitelock on, on drums. And um, those guys, you know, I couldn't be luckier having them in my band. They're just like amazing talents. And everyone is just really excited going on tour to begin with. And then the fact that we're supporting Jakey Lee um, is something that makes it all that much cooler. Um, like I said, you know, he's one of um, one of my top biggest influences from back in the day. I'll, I'll never forget the, the day that I, you know, that I flipped through the channels and landed right on the solo of Bark at the Moon when I was a teenager. And for me, that was, that really changed my life that day. I just could not believe what I what I was witnessing. So all these years later, to go on tour with, uh, with the man himself, Jakey Lee, this is something that, you know, I I didn't see happening, and I'm just really happy that Jake is back on the scene. I, I didn't think that was even going to happen. So, yeah, um, I'm very excited, and, you know, as you know, here in New England, the winters can be pretty depressing, so I'm just really happy to go on tour in the winter. I don't think it's depressing. It's just a pain in the rear end to get around <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, we'll have to get around a lot of different places. <laughs> and going up to Canada and um, doing that during the winter. That's going to be challenging, but at the same time, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I can't wait.
like. I guess all I have left is what is next for Ethan Brosh? Are you already back at writing yet another instrumental? And if so, what can you tell us about it? Um, yes, actually, I am writing another instrumental. It's not officially because uh, I, you know, I don't have anything specific in mind and I, it's not something that I really planned on doing. But again, the other night I was going over some material and I have like 10, like 10 incomplete songs. And um, yeah, so it seems like at some point there is probably going to be another instrumental record. And what I can tell you about it is that I guess it's just going to be very, very melodic because because um, a lot of the emphasis this time is really on melody. And yeah, that's all I can say at this point, because um, it's really incomplete. And yeah, what's next besides that? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm really putting all my attention and energy right now towards the, the upcoming tour in December. And after that, there's the NAMM show and some other projects that I'm sure will pop up real soon. It sounds interesting and it sounds like you're going to keep busy regardless. So that's always a good thing. At this time, yeah. I want to say thank you, Ethan. Ethan Brosh, amazing guitarist. I wish you the best with Live the Dream. I hope it does even better than what it's doing now. I wish you the best on this tour with Jakey Lee. I wish you the best on this new instrumental. Keep on rocking, man, and blow those riffs out of the water because you do. I, I still don't know how you do it, man. I try picking up a guitar and my fingers are like dumb. They just like, bleh. <laughs> Well, thank you so, so very much for a great interview, Greg. I really appreciate that. Hey, no problem. Anytime. And again, all the and best. Thanks to anyone listening. All the best, man, and metal up rock and roll. Keep on rocking yourself, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ethan Brosh. You got to check his stuff out. Go to YouTube. Just amazing work. Highly talented individual. You really got to check him out. I want to thank him. I want to thank NewEnglandConcertReviews.com for hooking us up as well. We're going to play a couple more songs. Right now, another new track from John Butcher Axis. This is off of Experienced. Yes, Jimi Hendrix, Crosstown Traffic, right here on WSUR.